Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Our reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. If you're in need of a Bible this morning, you can look to the aisles. Our ushers have those available for you. And if you do not own a Bible at home, you may take that with you. It's our gift to you. If you have one of the Bibles that were just handed out, we're on page 886. Please follow along as I read. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning and the ability to gather in this place. Just pray for Pastor Mike this morning as he just preaches from your word. May his words be yours, and may we receive them in our hearts. We love you. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Mike, and I get to be the pastor here. Uh, if you're new here today, I sure am glad that you're here. Uh, if I've never met you before, I'd love to do that. And so there's a couple of ways that we can do that. Either um, you can meet me out in the lobby right after service, or you can fill out the Connect card or scan the QR code on the Connect card. Or uh, if you want, you can just send me a text, 602-763-3331. Uh, those are all just different ways that we can connect. So I got to tell you, I love this time of year. Uh, I love the traditions of this time of year. I love the lights. I love the trees. Uh, you, can you tell it's Christmas in here? We've, we've jumped. We've gotten, yes, Thanksgiving's been properly celebrated and properly passed on, and, and now it's Christmas time. So it's definitely Christmas in here. We got a couple of trees, uh, and that's been good. So Janine and uh, her team did a great job decorating, and we're excited about it. So it's that time of the year where we get to look at the Christmas story. Uh, we just get to look at this story, and it doesn't seem to matter if we've heard this story once or twice or a hundred times. It's always a really good story. Um, it, it's great. And it's a reminder as we look at the Christmas story that the Christmas story is just part of a large story, uh, sometimes referred to as the upper story, that's been going on since the beginning of time. And so I want to just quickly walk you through the entire upper story of the Bible, uh, if we could. Um, imagine the stage as a timeline. And you think about Genesis over here, it's the very, very beginning. And you think about Revelation over there, that's what's going to happen. This is the story. This is what happened. God makes the world, and it's perfect, and everything works like it's supposed to. Adam and Eve are in the garden, and they get to walk with God, and God walks with them, and he's their God, and they're his people. And it's wonderful, and it goes really, really good. And God says, there's one rule I want you to follow, just this one rule I want you to follow. Don't eat from this one particular tree. There's a, a, the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, and I don't want you to eat from that. And Satan comes as a serpent and he deceives Eve first and then Adam and they take and they eat of that. And on that day, God has to send them off and away out of the garden. And in that moment, sin enters the world and it breaks the world. And in that moment, God and his people, God and his creation are separated. And then after that, uh, the story goes on. Uh, all this stuff that happens up until the time of Jesus' birth is called the Old Testament. And so what it looks like, what it kind of sounds like is God takes these people uh, that, that have, have gone off and they've sinned and they've done their own thing, and God decides to make a people for himself. And so he takes one man, he, a man named Abraham, and he comes to Abraham and he says, I'm going to set you aside, and from you there's going to be an offspring which will be my people, the Jewish people, the, the, the Hebrews, and they're going to be from Abraham. Abraham. And God uh, says, hey, if you will follow me and do what I ask you to do, things will go well for you. And when we read through the Old Testament, we see time and time again, when God's people follow him and do what God has planned for them, things go well. And when they don't, things go bad. After a while, things go really, really bad for God's people, and they find themselves in captivity. Uh, they're, uh, they're enslaved under Pharaoh, and they're living as slaves, and that's what they're doing. They're serving a foreign king, and they're living as slaves uh, in this section of the story right here. And in that section, what happens is God goes, and he calls on a man named Moses, and he says, I want you to go to Egypt and go and get my people out, get, bring my people out of there. And so Moses goes to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, and he says, hey, God says, let 
let my people go. And of course, Pharaoh doesn't want to do this. These are his slaves, and he likes having them there doing slave labor and all that kind of stuff. And so he says, I'm not going to do it. And so God performs all these signs and wonders and miracles. And eventually, God's people get free from Pharaoh, and they find themselves out in the wilderness with Moses. And God says to them, I'm going to give you some rules that I want you to live by. And so he asks Moses to go up on a mountain, and he gives them 10 commandments. He said, here's 10 rules. I want you to follow these rules. And what we see all throughout the rest of the Old Testament is that the people, God's chosen people, struggle to follow those rules. And God gives them all kinds of different tools to help them do that. There's a point where God's people said, if we just had judges, that would really help us a lot. We'd know what the rules say and how to follow them if we just had judges. And so God gives them judges, and they still don't follow God's rules. And then they say, well, God, if we just had a king, all these other countries, all these other nations, they have a king. Can we get a king? And so God gives them a king. First he gives them Saul and then David and then a long line of other kings. And yet the people still sin. They still turn away from God over and over and over again. And so then God gives them prophets and the prophets tell them, hey, this is what's happening. This is what God is saying. A prophet is somebody that speaks to the people on behalf of God. And what we see from the day that Adam and Eve sin in the garden all the way up through the time of the kings, through the time of the prophets, is that people struggle to follow God. People choose sin over and over and over again. And so what we celebrate, the Christmas story, happens right here in in, in what we would call the New Testament, if we're just thinking about the stages of the timeline, when Jesus comes as a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger in Bethlehem. That's what happens in this part of the story. Jesus comes and it changes everything. Uh, The rest of the the Bible is called the New Testament. We see uh, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we learn about the stories of Jesus. If you're ever wondering, like, hey, where should I look in my Bible if I just want to learn about the stories of Jesus? That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We see that Jesus, while he's here, he lives a perfect life, he dies a horrific death, and he defeats death so that anyone who would believe in him could spend eternity with him. And then Jesus goes back up to heaven. He literally like ascends in front of his friends. He goes back up to heaven. But right before he goes up to heaven, he tells all of his people, listen to me. He said, listen, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and I'm commanding you. I'm giving you a commandment. This is what you should be doing. You should go out into all the world, teach people everything I've taught you, baptize them in my name, and help them to to get to know me. That's what you're supposed to do. Go teach, baptize. That's what you're supposed to do. And then as we're reading through the Bible, we see uh, the book of Acts. That talks about how the church gets started, how the church gets started, and it gets persecuted and spread, and it goes all over the place. It gets persecuted and spread. Uh, We see all these different letters giving instructions on what it is to live like a Christian. We just went through one of these letters together, Ephesians. And then at the end of the Bible, we see the book of Revelation. And what that tells us is what's coming. And this entire thing, if you look at the whole thing from creation all the way through Revelation, that is sometimes referred to as this upper story, this huge story that's God's story. And all of it, every single bit of it points to Jesus. Every single bit of it points to the need for Jesus. All of these people that lived all along this time, they needed the same thing that you and I need. We need a Savior. We need that baby that's wrapped in, a, in, in swaddling clothes in the major. We need that. And so we love this story because it is critical to what we need. This is why we celebrate at Christmas. This is why we do all this other stuff. This is why we do all the other decorations. This is why we go out of our way to invite our friends during this season, during this Advent season, because we have a great story to tell. We have the Christmas story. And all throughout this upper story, there's these lower stories going on. There's just parts in the lower story that are going on like the Christmas story. This Christmas story is fantastic and we love it because it has everything. The Christmas story has an evil king. Like we know who the bad guy in the story is and it has wise men and shepherds and angels and a new mom and a dad and it has a baby. But you still might wonder, well, what kind of story is this? What is the Christmas story? We're, we're calling this a Christmas story, Christmas at Mission Valley. We're calling it that. So what kind of story is it? And so in the four Sundays that lead up to Christmas this year, we're going to see that this is a story of hope, a story of peace, a story of joy, and a story of love. And so we'll start today with a reminder that the Christmas story is a story of hope. If you're wondering, like, what kind of story is this? What kind of story is the Christmas story? What is a story of hope? And so as I was preparing for this series, it occurred to me that the term hope may make some of you anxious or nervous. 
it's possible that you hear the term hope and it, it, it doesn't go good for you. You, you. you don't feel good about this. I think it is fair to assume that for all of us from time to time, hoping for something hasn't worked out like we want it to. Sometimes we'll be hoping for something and it just doesn't go the way we would like to. I remember being a little kid and hoping that my parents would change their mind about the divorce and that it would mean I wouldn't have to move to Arizona. But they didn't change their mind and I did have to move. I remember being in elementary school hoping that that kid that was bullying me every day would stop. I remember just hoping that he would stop and he just wouldn't stop. I remember hoping that my grandma would live long enough to meet my son, but she didn't. I remember two years ago this week, hoping that my mom could fight off cancer just a little bit longer so she could have one more Christmas, but she didn't. And I imagine many of you have hoped for things that haven't worked out also. Maybe you found yourself hoping for something and it just hasn't worked out. Maybe you've hoped for relationships that just haven't gone the way you want them to go. Maybe you've hoped for children that you haven't been able to hold. Maybe some of you have hoped for financial security that you just can't seem to get your hands on. It just just seems to keep evading you as much as you want it to work out. Maybe you've hoped and hoped and hoped for something that you wanted or needed and it just hasn't worked out. And maybe, just maybe, the disappointment that has come from hope not working out has led to a lack of trust. Maybe somebody in this room today or listening online to this sermon has so little hope left that you actually feel hopeless today. We see uh, during this season is sometimes hard for people because as people are talking about all these things like hope and love and joy and peace, there are people that are literally walking around feeling hopeless. And if that's you today, if you've come into this place or you're listening to this sermon and you are feeling hopeless, if that's ever you in the future, maybe circumstances in your life change and you feel hopeless, I want you to know that I have good news for you today. I have good reason for you to sing today. I have good reason for you to celebrate this season for the first time or celebrate it again all to new. And that good news is our big idea today. The big idea is this. Hope is not something we do. It's something we have in Jesus. Church, I want us to understand this. Hope is not something we simply do. It is something we actually have. I'm telling you that if you've believed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, if you have been chosen, loved, and saved by Jesus Christ, you can stop hoping for this or that to happen. You can stop hoping that things will work out because you have hope. The Christmas story is a story of hope, not a story of people who simply hope for the best, but the story of hope that was promised, hope that has been delivered, and hope that is eternal. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at several passages from all over the Bible today. And if you have a Bible with you or if you have your app, please scroll along with us. But I want you to know they'll also be up on the screen We're going to look at a lot of passages today, and from those passages, we're going to see that this hope was promised, it was delivered, and it is eternal. And so the first idea that we have this morning is Jesus is the hope that was promised. Jesus is the hope that was promised. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, all the way at the beginning of our story. This is right after God has to tell Adam and Eve, you're going to have to leave the garden. This is right after they've sinned and chosen sin and broken the world. This is what it says. It says, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Again, this is right after Adam and Eve sinned. This is right after Satan feels like he's won. He's separated God from man. He's tempted them and they've fallen for this temptation and he feels like it's going good and the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, feel horrible. They feel shame and they feel separation because they've sinned. They've chosen their way instead of God's way. They've 
chose to do what they wanted instead of what God wanted. And all of us as sinners have felt this before. They are just feeling shame and guilt. But, but so much shame and guilt is going on. And in that moment, God's promise is there for them. He says, one day, one day, everything's going to be right. One day, one of your offspring is going to come and he's going to crush Satan's head. He's going to crush the serpent's head. God is going to win. I want us to remember that even though Jesus is born here in the storyline, Jesus is promised here. Jesus is promised at the very, very beginning. And that promise will not wane. The promise will go on and on and on. We see the promise reiterated in Isaiah 7, 13 through 14, which says, And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Guys, listen to this. The, Jesus is born here, but 700 years before that, Isaiah says, hey, Jesus is still coming. Don't worry. He's still coming. He's coming. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be a savior. It's going to be fantastic. I know it's hard, but this promise is coming. The promise that's made over here is renewed all throughout the Old Testament, and it's reminded that Jesus is coming. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and said, hope will come, and he will be born from a virgin, and she shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This means that when Jesus is born, he's born without blemish, he's perfect, and he stays perfect so that he can be the perfect sacrifice. And I want us to realize that generations after God promised hope in the garden, God is renewing that promise through Isaiah. And it goes on, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 says this, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and the peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. God not only reinforces his promise of hope, not only reminds the people through Isaiah, hey, hope is coming, but he also gives them a preview of how much hope this is going to be. It's not just that you have hope, you have this really fantastic hope. Well, what will that hope look like? If you're just living here in this period of time, like this 700 years before Jesus is born, if you're just trying to figure out, well, what's it going to look like? God, you've been promising us hope since the garden. What is that hope going to look like? What is this? What are we waiting for? What kind of hope will it be? Well, that hope will be a wonderful counselor. He'll be a mighty God. He'll be an everlasting father. He will be the prince of peace, and his kingdom will never be overthrown. I want us to realize that when they are being reminded and renewed this promise, that God is giving them more details about how fantastic it's going to be. Jesus is going to be so worth the wait. God is telling his people that this promise is coming. It's still coming. I want us to remember that it's coming. And then all throughout the Old Testament, there are over 300 prophecies that promise hope is coming in the person of Jesus. Over and over again, all throughout this upper story, back here in the Old Testament, all throughout it, God reminds him over and over and over again. Micah 5.2 says that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Hosea 11.1 says he's going to spend time in Egypt. We don't have time to read through all of these today. You just have to just take my word for it or listen for your email this week when you're all going to get a fantastic reminder about it. Ezekiel 37.24 says he will come from the house of David. Isaiah 9.1 and 2 says that he will start his ministry in Galilee. 2 Samuel 7.14 says he will be the son of God. God promised the hope of Jesus in the garden, and he has renewed that promise. He has renewed the promise of that hope for generations. He's renewed it for generations. He wants us to know that this hope that was coming with Jesus has been well worth the wait. Now, of course, the promise of hope can only be fully appreciated when it's delivered, Right? I mean, we all understand this. Promises made are never as sweet as promises delivered. Right? It's great to get a promise, but until that thing gets delivered, like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the other day I ordered something. I really wanted it to come, and it was supposed to be there on Tuesday, and it didn't come till Thursday. And I felt a little gypped. Right? Like when it gets there, that's when the promise feels good. Uh, some of us, some of us uh, young, uh, as young men, stood at an aisle and we, we, we looked at our bride and we said, I promise to love you for the rest of my life. 
But on the day that we die, if we have lived out that promise, that will be promise delivered. That's different. You understand? Promise made versus promise delivered. And so what has to happen for God's promise to truly be appreciated, it has to be delivered. And the promise of hope that God made all those years ago was delivered as a baby in a manger. Church, I want us to know that Jesus is the hope that was delivered. He's the hope that was delivered. God is not a liar. He did exactly what he said he would do. Luke 2, 10 through 12 says, And the angel said to him, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. After generations of waiting, Jesus finally comes. He comes as a baby. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes, just as the Old Testament prophecies said he would. And of course, he's not going to stay a baby. He's going to grow up to be a man. He's going to heal the sick and give sight to the blind. He's going to give wisdom to fools and make the wise look like fools. He's going to teach things that give hope and confuse teachers. He would live a perfect life, die a horrific death, and defeat that death to give hope to everyone who would believe. And this is real hope. This is real hope. This is hope that doesn't put us to shame. This is hope that we can put our trust of our lives in. This is real hope. You know, if you're honest, if you've ever placed hope in something only to find out that that person or that thing where you placed your hope was not worthy of it, you know the shame and pain that goes with that. If you've ever placed your hope on somebody or something that has failed to deliver on the promises that it made, you know the shame and the pain that goes with it. If you've ever put your hope in a relationship that didn't work out, you know the pain and the shame that comes with that. If you've ever put your hope in finances only to have a problem that those finances cannot fix, you know the shame and the pain that comes from it. If you've ever put your hope in a leader only to have that leader let you down, you know the pain and the shame that comes with it. And so I understand our reluctance to hope. But Jesus can and does handle our hope in a way where you will not experience shame or pain. That's why we look at Romans 5, 1 through 5. We read it together. Let's look at it again. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him, we also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. In Jesus, even our suffering, even our hard days, even our days when we just don't even feel like getting up in the morning, even the worst days ever produce endurance, which leads to character, which leads to hope, and that is the hope that won't put us to shame. Church, we have good reason to sing today. We have good reason to have hope in the baby that was delivered because he will not let us down. Jesus will not let you down. Jesus will not put you to shame. Jesus will not abandon you. He will not change his mind and leave you. Jesus will never decide you're no longer worthy. I made a mistake on you and I don't want you anymore. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus is for you forever, with you forever, and he'll never leave you. And that's why you can place your hope in him. If you are a Christian, Jesus has chosen you, saved you, and loved you. Jesus is not just someone we hope for. Jesus is the one in whom we place our hope. He's hope delivered. He's hope promised. It wasn't like God made a promise and then never brought it through. He delivered them. Jesus is the hope who was delivered there in the manger and the hope that is delivered even today to all who believe. The third idea is this this morning. Jesus is the hope that is eternal. Jesus is the hope that is eternal. 
It's not like it's over. It's not like it ended the day that Jesus went up into heaven. Jesus is the hope that is eternal. Listen to what it says in Luke 1, 31 to 33. It says, And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is eternal eternal hope. This is never-ending hope. This is hope that cannot run out, hope that will not run out because it is eternal hope. Jesus will literally reign forever. We know what Jesus is doing right now. We can fast forward to the end of the story and we know what Jesus is going to be doing, but he's literally doing it right now. Jesus is reigning. This is significant because it means you can place your hope in something that is eternal. You and I both know how much we're tempted to place hope in other things that are temporary. How many of us have placed hope in temporary things? On Saturday, I placed so much hope in Ohio State just beating Michigan. Like, y'all didn't have to play anybody all year. And if you'll just beat Michigan, everything will be fine. And we'll go to the college football playoffs. And then they didn't do it. They blew it. It screwed up my whole day. And this was right after I placed some hope in ASU. I have two college loves. I just I can't decide between the two. And both of them broke my heart on the same weekend. First, ASU just, just gets beat by that team from down south. I won't even say the name. It just disgusts me so much. I won't pollute God's word by saying it out loud. But anyways, they lost. And then, and then, and then Ohio State loses. And then all I'm thinking is if some way, if some way Notre Dame can figure out how to beat USC, maybe we got a chance of backdooring our way in. If the Irish could just do one thing that I've ever wanted to do in my life. But no, they lose too. You see what happens when we place hope in temporary things. Some of you are feeling my pain. I, some of you know. I see Matt back there crying. It's all right, buddy. We all do it. You know what it is to place hope in temporary places. We're tempted to place hope in relationships, but relationships change over time for various reasons, and therefore they can't hold the weight of our hope. We're tempted to place hope in people, in parents, in spouses, heck, even in pastors, but all people are sinners, and as such, they cannot hold the weight of our hope. We're tempted to place our hope in money. But anybody who's lived long enough knows that there are times in life when money just cannot help you, when no amount of money can hold the weight of your hope. Two years ago, I remember calling my brother. My brother was able to make it to the hospital. My mom was dying, and I said, hey, if there's anything that can be done, I'm on my way down. If there's anything that can be done, if you need my credit card, like if there's anything, if there's like experimental stuff, like does she need a different treatment? Is there a better doctor? We can fly somebody in. Is there anything we can do? I just want her to live long enough so I can make them drive from, from Phoenix to Tucson. Is there anything? And there was nothing that money could do. It was hopeless. It couldn't handle the weight of my hope. I remember hoping, just let me get down there. I didn't even make it out of my neighborhood. You see, he couldn't handle that hope. The only thing that can hold the weight of our hope, the only thing that is unchanging and ever-present and eternal is Jesus Christ. It's the only place that makes sense to place our hope because it's the only thing that's not going to change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He won't change. He won't grow weary. He won't get tired of holding the weight of your hope. He is eternal. He will reign on His throne forever. He will reign in God's kingdom forever, a kingdom that we know is coming. Here's the hope that we have in Scripture. We know the kingdom is coming. It's not like we're people that sit around saying, I sure hope God's kingdom comes someday. I sure hope that someday that works out. Sure seems like it would be really cool if one day that thing that God promised way over here would work out way over there. I sure hope it works out. We're not people like that. We're people that say, I know that's coming. I literally know that's coming. One day God's going to send Jesus back down here. He's going to make everything right, and it's going to be perfect again like it was in the beginning. I know that's coming. I'm not hoping it'll work out. I know it's coming. Of course, we won't fully experience it until Jesus comes back, but God's story already gives us a glimpse of what it's going to look like. Revelation 21, 1 through 7 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. 
And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and the death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Christian, one day you will walk with God and He will be your God and you will be His son or daughter. That is a fact. That is what's going to happen. That is how the story ends. If that hasn't happened, it's not over yet. The same God that delivered the promise of Jesus as a manger will fulfill the promise that He made that says one day you will again walk with Him and you can rest your life on that hope. You don't have to hope that it'll all just work out. You can live with the hope that it will. You can put all your hope in Jesus because he's eternal. You see, if you have Jesus, you have hope. You have hope that was promised way at the beginning. You have hope whose promise was renewed all throughout the Old Testament. You have hope that was delivered as a baby in Bethlehem. You have hope that lived the perfect life, died a horrific death, and defeated that death before going back to his father. You have hope that is eternal, that will never change. That is what you have. You have hope. I've had that hope. I have that hope. That's what my whole life is based on. I spent 17 years without it, and then I got it. And I want you to have it if you don't have it. If you're here today and you don't have that hope, if you're listening in on this sermon, if you're just tuning in online and you say, I don't even have that hope, like how do I get that? Like what, how, how, what would I have to be able to believe to get that? How could I have that hope? Because I don't feel hopeful right now. Maybe there's somebody in the room that's saying, I don't feel any hope at all. As a matter of fact, I feel the opposite of that. I feel hopeless. Maybe as I'm telling these stories about the things that you might be tempted to place your hope in, you're saying, I've placed my hope in all of those things and none of it's working out. I've tried finances, I've tried relationships, I've tried people, and all of it's let me down. If that's you today, let me just share the gospel with you. Let me just share with you what you need to believe if you want to have eternal hope. The gospel is this, God made the world and it was beautiful. It was beautiful and it was perfect just like he created it, but then man sinned and broke it. You and I see evidence of this sin all around us. On Thanksgiving Day, we thought we'd just go around and we would just deliver some, some sandwiches and some meal packs to people that were homeless. And it took us 20 minutes to run out of 50 meal packs. That's how many homeless people were just right around our neighborhood. That's how broken the world is. That's how horrible it is out there right now. We could have gone out for three days and we would have never had enough sandwiches just for the people in this city that are homeless. It's broken everywhere. We see it all around us. It's horrible and it's all the result of sin. That's what's going on. And the truth is it's our sin that did that. You and I know we have sinned against a perfect and holy God. We have committed cosmic treason. We choose our way over and over again. Adam and Eve chose it in the garden. The Egyptians chose it in the desert. You and I choose it every single day when we do what we want and not what God wants. When we believe what we want and not what God says. We do it over and over again. And the worst part of that sin, the worst part of that brokenness is that it separates us from God. It separates us from him. God is so perfect that he can't be around that sin. And the thing that's so unbelievably amazing and hopeful is that our God would not leave us in that separated state. He just refused to leave us separated from him. God's story is about him chasing his people down their whole lives. Their whole lives. God chased me down for 17 years before I finally believed. And maybe he's chasing you down right now. And the way that he chases us is he sent Jesus down here on a rescue mission to save us. 
While Jesus was here, he came as a baby, grew up to be a man that lived this perfect life, died this horrific death, and defeated that death so that anyone who would believe in him could spend eternity with him. And if you can believe that, if you can listen to that story and say, I believe that, I truly believe that in my heart, you can know that God has already changed your heart. Because you wouldn't be able to believe that without it. This story sounds crazy without God changing your heart. And so if he has, if you could sit here and say, I totally believe that, I, I, I believe that, then I would invite you to pray this morning. I would invite you to pray, to ask God, to just say, God, I am a sinner and I'm sorry. I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. I need you to save me because I can't save myself. I believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The Bible says that if we can confess that with our mouth and believe it in our heart, then we will be saved. And if you can do that, you will have hope that is eternal. So church, can you believe today? Can you believe what God said, what God delivered, and what God will bring forever? Let's pray. God, we're thankful for your promise. We're, th we're so thankful for your promise that though we've sinned over and over and over again, you've made a way for us to spend eternity with you. We're thankful for the promise that you made in the garden, the promise that you renewed for generations, the promise that was delivered in Bethlehem, and the promise that is sitting on the throne right now. God, if there's anybody in this room today, anybody in this room today, or listening to this sermon that has never believed in you, I ask you to do what only you can do. I ask you to give them the faith to believe. God, I ask you to change their heart. Help them believe. And for the people that are in the room today who have been tempted to put faith and hope in something besides you, remind us that it is only you that can hold the weight of our hope. Help us to believe anew today. Help us to go forward in this season with real hope. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.